memory that workers AICPA data analytics research initiative. And uh, now we have seven firms, the three, the three large, the four largest plus other three, AICPA and Canadian Institute. And the Australians are starting to get interested, maybe they'll be joining this. Okay, and at this moment we have four projects proposed. One we, we call it uh, the sandbox. That and that's at this moment internal control evaluation. Automated. Second one is exceptional exceptions. I mentioned it last time, and that's basically um, looking at exceptions. The third one. is visualization. And I have a slide on this one. And now we are talking about one more project. I'm not totally sure uh, what, where it's going to go. I don't still have anyone working on this. And uh, all is data evidence. Okay, uh, so are you ready, Chao Chao, to go, or should I wait? Uh, yes, I already started ready? The recording. Tell me when I can start. You, you can start. Okay. <laughs> so what I did is, uh, it's not I used Chao's approach to take a picture of everything, and so I went into the into Adam's book and picked up uh, his graphic of, uh, of the traditional auditing process. And I uh, took a picture of it and put it in a slide. And because what I showed you last time, I went with like kind of big stages, and this is a little bit more detail that I thought was worth, worth going through this. And what I'm trying to do is save you some effort in reading an entire auditing book and maybe kind of set you up in a way that you can um, that you can choose an area that you want to work. So this is the traditional method of audit. Analytics is going to turn this around somehow. But I don't think anyone knows how this is going to be turned around. No one has really resolved the issue of uh, how do you put analytics in an audit, and I think part of the effort is what we are doing in radar, and it's very interesting because these seven firms are competitive. They compete with each other, and, I, and although they have been in Center for Audit Quality and they have been in the ICPA, um, this is really probably the first formal research cooperation that they have. And yesterday we had uh, a telephone call, a two-hour telephone call, and they had an antitrust lawyer spend an hour telling them the things they can't do. And I was a little bit disappointed and worried about it uh, because I'm afraid that they are being scared of cooperating with each other. And so that, that would be a difficulty that we are going to have to, to deal with. Um, so, there are two situations in an audit. And by the way, important distinction here. External audit versus internal audit. In my research, I typically don't make a lot of distinctions. But I was made very, very aware recently that there is a big distinction. And when I proposed originally these projects and rolled them up, uh, they said, ah, this is what we're doing, is it not audit, we want to do external. So now we're going to have to think more about external audit and use Andrea as our consultant here to see 
what external auditors do. But actually what I have done is I have talked with Trevor Stewart. Trevor Stewart is a, was a, is a retired partner of Deloitte. And at Deloitte, he developed the STAR method. The STAR method is regression applications and audit. And they have been using it for, I would say, 20 years. And so Trevor, and Trevor helped me to external auditize these projects, think about it in terms of external audit. And I don't probably recruit, there are seven firms, so our advisory board, we have seven partners who are the leaders in audit analytics in the firms, and uh, the ICPA, who is acting by federal the ICPA. And so I'm going to recruit them to help me to make this a little bit more external audit oriented. But secretly, I'm still thinking that external audit and external audit are the same thing. Is a verification procedure, and the methodology should be reasonably parallel. And uh, interestingly enough, in the conversation yesterday prior to the lawyer, uh, there was a lot of discussion about internal audit being ahead in audit analytic methodology, and in the conferences, same kind of thing. Uh, for you that are in AIS, even accounting students, you can talk with the means. Uh, with you, uh, they all went to the conference and they saw what the kind of things I'm describing to you. So you can discuss to them what they had. They also went strand were stranded for two or three days in Houston because we would come back. So, so we had a chance to go to nice restaurants. We went to NASA and saw the big the big equipment there. And so that's fun too. But we, everyone was pretty. Also, we had two of our ex PhD students uh, there visiting. We do, we do got a PhD here in 2003, and she was the first PhD student that uh, emphasized AIS. Before that, we had accounting and AIS mixed, or they were the same thing. And Hui has actually a very nice, very nice record. She just got a full professor. She could be in a much better university than she is. And uh, David Chen was there, who is now here in St. John, and he graduated about three years ago. And this is kind of something which had been happening more. I go to conferences, and see a lot of our ex students there. Uh, and they continue doing research. Actually, Hui and, uh, Hui, Hui and one of the other, <coughs> on, uh, other PhD students, you can't just have your paper accepted in JAP, so it's pretty good. Okay. So there are two situations in the external audit thing. One situation is whereby you are repeating an audit, and the other situation is when you are trying to sell an audit or trying to decide decide if you will take an audit or not. Now, history has evolved a lot, and in the old days you would take any audit that was offered to you uh, because you made money. These days, there is this kind of trade-off between taking an audit and making money, meaning assuming an engagement, or the risk that you're taking in the engagement. And uh, most of the lawsuits, like 60% of lawsuits against auditors, um, are at bankruptcy stage. I mentioned this last time. Uh, I repeat things because uh, sometimes you don't remember, and sometimes needed in the discussion. Uh, but litigation against auditors um, is very expensive, and uh, the reward curve is very unbalanced. If you get into a litigation situation, you spend much more money than you would be earning in the engagement. So it's a symmetric reward curve, with a big penalty against, very big penalty against potential litigation. Now, who goes bankrupt? Is the weaker firms, the firms with the higher risk? So this early stage here, um, accept clients and perform initial plan, planning, there is a stage before that that I, um, that I mentioned is the engagement evaluation. And if you were a firm, like a CPA firm, and someone, let's say a high-tech company, came 
foreign engagement. What kind of evidence, what kind of things you would try to find out about them before you accepted them as a client? Previous audit report. Say that again? Previous report, audit report. Okay, so. Previous audit report. How would you do that? You would go to, if it's a public company, you would go to the SEC, right. Edgar, and pick up the different reports they have there. Change of auditor is, is one report, the other report is opinion report. So you look, typically firms don't contact each other because this is like you pick up, you pick up a new girlfriend, you're not going to ask the, the old boyfriend <laughs> if you should be dating her or not, correct? Yes or no? <laughs> You're an expert on these methods. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What else will you find out? You look at industry blogs like Factiva or Wall Street Journal. Industry, what do you call it? Blogs? Blogs. L O G S? B L O G S. Blogs. For what? To see if there's been, if the company has been in any litigation or any significant matter. Lou, what, how would you find out Instead of going to the industry blocks, how would you find out if a company has been having litigation or other kind of events? Uh, Think big day. You can you can Google it. Hmm? You can Google. Just yes, that's it's kind of look for sources external. You look at Factiva, which has a lot of news pieces. You can look at Professor Raj Vivastava from Kansas has this thing called Seek Info. Uh, you can, and by the way, Seek Info is available if you want to use it for research. It has uh, all the SEC uh, documents, so it facilitates your life, and it has a very nice uh, search of it. And actually, Chow, when you have a chance, have a look at Seek Info and one of these classes, give them a little demo to, faci to facilitate that entry. Okay, it's good for you learn something too. Oh, Seek info. Uh, we bought it. I don't know where it is. Actually, I have been students that have been using it. We just need to find it. Okay. Um, and you can look at, as, as Andrea said, industry blogs. You can look at things like uh, um, Facebook. You can just look at many different sources. And actually, this is kind of a new thing. You not only look at the firm. What else do you look The officers of the firm, the people that run the firm, to see if they have a criminal record. Sometimes they do things like hire private investigators. I have a firm to do this evaluation. And you are looking for previous litigation. You are looking for bad behavior by executives. And then you are looking for the inherent risk. You are looking, is that industry and that business a very dangerous business? Now, you understand the reason why you are doing this. This is the reason, the reason we knew 10, 15 years that we are doing this. Another thing to understand on the industry now is that litigation in, aud for, in auditing was a very big problem. 
Now, typically firms are insured. So if a big scandal erupts and costs a lot of money, insurance company typically pays. But the firms have kind of a self-insurance mechanism whereby they pull together and they self-insure. And that has some kind of strange effects. Um, and uh, if one firm has a big damage, the other firms will pay for it a little bit, which is kind of strange. Um, but you know, insurance is some degree of protection they have, etc. Now, what has happened for many years, um, litigation was a huge problem. In the recent years, actually, uh, the level of litigation went down and the cost went down. But you know, I kind of wondering, uh, the auditors of Petrobras in Brazil, where there was this major scandal of bribery, okay, they won't be able to argue that's PwC, won't be able to argue that uh, that it's not material. You know, the level of payoffs is five, six, seven percent of the contracts. And SAS 99 also says that you should be looking for fraudulent behavior to a certain degree. Um, what do you think that the auditors of Volkswagen will do? Is that, a, you know, the the cheating on the remission test, is that an audit problem? I think you're saying, no. What do you think, Andrea? It's debatable because typically the firm will have or hire a specialist to value you know, environmental assets. So they should have done due diligence, but I'm not sure. Yeah. There is a thing. S A S B Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Bloomberg is the chairman of that thing. And this is kind of a new initiative of measuring sustainability. And some people say this is totally soft and there is no value for it at all. And some people say this is very important. Um, Ahmed uh, our PhD student here actually is looking at SASB. I put him in contact with a couple of people. I don't know too much about SASB, but uh, maybe that's accounting of the future. Sustainability uh, is associated to accounting and is expanded set of, in addition to accounting, there is all the environmental stuff. I, I actually don't know, and I'm very curious what's going to be the responsibility of the auditor and folks. And first, the damages there are going to be clearly material. The damages there are going to, they, they estimating, some people are estimating $48 billion of damages to, to fix the problems there. Uh, this decrease in sales hasn't been as steep as people anticipated. Uh, some people are estimating the damages are in the $20 billion, still pretty big amounts of money. And I really don't know. I thought it was interesting what you said. I really don't know if there is auditor liability or not in this thing. Uh, in this case, you know, there is not a company is bankrupt and have no money. So the auditors are not going to be the first to be sued. You can always sue auditors when no one else has money in the whole environment. Okay? But in this case, Volkswagen has plenty of money. Um, interesting also to see if they are going to sue. Uh, there will be suits for sure. Okay, the question is what's going to be the suit. If they would sue management, the CEO of Volkswagen of that time uh, claims that he had no idea of this going on, but recent investigation has said that very high in the engineering side, everyone knew and planned it. Also, the other interesting thing that Volkswagen is that is they say that they, they only were cheating on their emissions in the US, not in Europe. And uh, some of the Europeans are contesting this. But it's a very interesting whole set of, of events. I, I'm going to raise one more issue for you to think a little bit. Um, if you have a major cyber security exposure, 
meaning someone breaks into your computers, and there are plenty of examples of that, and steals, you know, 10 million credit card numbers, or steals 100 million names with social security numbers. Is that an audit problem? I saw two faces going there. No, 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 no. You know, uh, ASAC, our assurance services are committed, is actually issuing a cyber security guidelines. We call it principles and criteria of cyber security. And uh, I, I probably can get to that. Let me just find this. I would probably be interested in seeing it. This is, remember, just recapping with you, we talked last time, ASA, Assurance Services Executive Committee. What is that? This is an organ of the AICPA, a special committee of the AICPA, which is directed at inventing new products for the audit, thinking of new things that the auditor can do. And so recently, what we have, we did the audit data standard. Um, we have been doing one of the initiatives is radar, actually. And we did SysTrust and WebTrust. WebTrust was a attestation of, um, of websites. And then SysTrust was system reliability. So system reliability and cybersecurity are a little bit rel related, correct? And there is a thing called elder care, was an assurance that a particular hospital or a particular care is Institute uh, uh, reported correctly. And there were actually, the Elliott Committee came out with 142 different potential assurance things. And most of them didn't survive, but uh, associated to this, there were principles or criteria to compare against. And so basically, an auditor issues an opinion when he is independent and there is a standard towards him which he can compare the reports being issued. So there are these, these key elements here. There is a report, and there is a standard, and the auditor doesn't say exactly that these reports are correct, but the auditor say that these reports were fairly represented Fairly represented as a monitor, fairly represented in accordance to these standards. And so if there are no standards, this is a little bit difficult. But now the AICP is thinking about some form of report that they issue, audit opinion, that really just says uh, we looked at what people said. Uh, there are no standards, etc. So they are still thinking about about exactly how to do that. Okay. So this first stage of the audit, which is not even there, is the stage of having a look at the firm and what were the things that we talked about: corruption, previous corruption by management. Second thing is legal environment. And third thing is the inherent risk, meaning if that particular environment is risky or not. Now, an aside note on this engagement thing, it's a public good note. Um, if the, uh, a lot of the literature, you will see a lot of the, the literature says the big four are the best auditors. They provide the best audit services. They are more expensive, but they, they provide the best audit service. Now, if the big four do this investigation and the weak firms go to lesser auditors, is that good for society or is it bad for society? Bad. 
bad? Very bad for society. Why? Because a good auditor can improve a lot of things in shaky firms. You know, when the firm is just corrupt, they can't do too much. Okay? And actually, there's a lot of talk in all the literature that if for corrupt management, fraudulent management, auditing is very difficult. But if management is, re is reasonably honest, but it's a shaky industry, they are poor managers, doesn't mean they are dishonest, uh, CPA firms can help a lot in improving management practices. And so society would be highly benefited if the better audit firms audit the more shaky firms to bring the shaky firms into better grounds. I, do you agree with that? Yes, no, maybe. You agree because you said it. <laughs> that makes sense. And actually, the CPA, the firms don't like to talk about that because obviously they, they are voting with their pockets, not with public good. Okay, so, and if you look at these steps here, uh, you would, uh, you came a little bit later, uh, it's a mess up there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I came in at 5.30 in the morning just to avoid it. Yeah. Um, but what I said before, actually, they, these steps also perform in acceptance of a client step. So you, you look at the industry, um, you look at the business, you look at the industry, and access the client business risk. Now, This, this I, we are doing actually an interesting study. The person who's doing this study is Helen Brown, Professor Brown. She'll be teaching you in the fifth class. And uh, with uh, Abdullah, who finished, but he's in, he is in Kuwait, but he's still working on this project. And I think Abdullah Man is participating. And what we did is what we call verbal protocol analysis. VPA. And let me tell you a little bit about that. You are going to actually read Mark and Biggs, which is an article about verbal photography. And if you want to find out what Yehuda is thinking, how do you find out? It's difficult, correct? <laughs> You can't put probes in his brain and read it, which is the ideal, correct? So he can't lie to you what he's, what he's thinking. Okay, so actually there, is a, there was a guy called Herb Simon. And Herb Simon is a Nobel laureate in economics, but he actually was a behavior scientist, professor at Carnegie Mellon, was kind of the god of this area. And the classic book, Simon and Newell, and it talks about, about uh, behavior model of the firm. That's the name of, of that particular thing. But he talks about artificial intelligence, etc. Herb Simon was, uh, the time I was doing my PhD, was the bomb of everything. And he, he developed this technology, Simon and Newell, called verbal protocol analysis. You can't probe into Yehuda's brain. So what do you do? You give the problem from, for Yehuda to analyze and then train him to verbalize his thoughts. So Yehuda is trying to resolve this case and he's saying, let me look at the numbers. Let me think about what kind of information I can get. If I see this information, this is my conclusion. And so that's the idea. And what you do is you extract a protocol script. The other thing is usually the researcher sits in the room while the person, while Yehuda is working on his problem. And if Yehuda stops talking, he says, don't stop talking. And usually what you do is you have a training session whereby you give them little problem and etc. etc. and train him to verbalize. Uh, Mark and Biggs is the famous article around this. Mark, the Ted Mark was my advisor. And Mark and Biggs um, uh, 
paper was published in the JAR, and since then there have been several other papers in this direction. And they actually used a case that had been used in other research. Um, as used several ways in terms of the evaluation case. And just as an amusing thing, at that time the editor of JAR was a guy called Nick Dobrich. He also was one of the gods of accounting at that time, and you'll see a lot in the financial area, you see Dobrich and Leftovich, Dobrich, there's a whole set of articles by Nick Dobrich. Um, and I saw them yelling at each other in a cocktail party. And Ted was saying, I submitted an article, why don't you want to publish it? And he said, your sample is four. And Ted says, my sample is 10,000, I don't remember the number. Because what he did, he had four partners of CPA firms do that case and verbalize it. But Ted would say, I captured and passed 10,000 uteruses. So what is the sample size? The number of uteruses or the number of partners? So that's what they, and credit to Nick, he actually published the article. And very wisely, because it's a very highly quoted article. That had stayed with me for a while, and I, I saw this whole thing, and I thought it was very interesting. But I don't like the methodology so much, because this verbalization uh, prompted with a fictitious case uh, goes farther from reality than, than I liked. And so what we did is we, we coaxed a big CPA firm to find us four partners. We actually got five. And we wanted to work on this area, this assessment. What happened here? <laughs> In this area of risk assessment, Okay, it's telling me that my class will be over in two hours. Okay, um, and uh, this the firm was very interested on that, and that's why they produced the partners for us. And we interviewed the first partner, and we recorded it, and then they suggested something that was, I wish I had been my idea to claim it, but he said, if you want verbalization of uh, what you think in risk assessment, uh, why don't you get a manager in here and, and use a risk planning session? Because what they do at the beginning of the engagement, the partner and the manager sit down and talk about the engagement and try to make the manager being a first year manager on that engagement. Therefore, he has to be educated on what is the situation with the client. Brilliant idea, I thought. And so we actually interviewed four partners with a manager. And the manager never had been in the engagement. And the manager studied the client and then sat down in the engagement. What do you think of that, Andrea? I thought it was interesting. Very interesting, yeah. isn't it? And also surprising that you got five partners. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure, but I hope to get more. Okay, but we'll be a little bit later on, on this. Thing. Uh, and so we got these guys, got these guys, we created a protocol. And then what you do is you pass the word. So it's very laborious. You pick up these re recordings. Your PhD students suffer because they have transcribed text. Okay? Then you separate it in uterances. And the uterances has a classification. This is get information, this is make a decision etc etc and then you classify them and then you kind of analyze the stages and how you do it so what we then I of course uh, with kind of my line of interest and work I said why don't we automatically capture text with things like Siri or Dragon software and etc and so um, Abdul Rahman is looking at that and Abdullah are looking at that as a Kuwaiti contingent, okay? And we actually want, it's not working very well yet, but it will work eventually, uh, at least to, to decrease the amount of work dramatically. You see the CIA, for example, when they, in a foreign language report, they use a machine to translate and they have a person to fix. And that supposedly 
to this old research, so it's much better now. Suppose we say it's 40 or 50% of the work. So I want to make that automated because I would like this type of research to be much more performed in many things. But our next step, and I think Abdul Rahman will be working on it, and maybe you, uh, I don't know who, uh, maybe you. Um, the next step on this is write a prototype of a risk assessment situation reducing the variables. So may, may they try to automate part of the thing, part of the thing is probably not automatable. But what's happening is that these risk assessment things, they really don't have a tool, they just talk. And say, oh, the client, this client now has started a, a, a set of chains in Canada, so we have international risk, or that someone sued them, and so we have this problem, and etc. And the variant the potential type of different things that can happen. And then after they have this kind of generic discussion, we learn this with the VPA, after they have the generic discussion, they actually go item by item in the balance sheet and in the income statement and say, how about uh, sales, okay, any big events in sales, okay. any risk we have in sales, and goes account element by element. This was a surprise for me, I didn't know that they, that's the way they evaluate risk. They went, the risk was account by account risk. Uh, that's the way they did it. And so I'm pretty sure now that we can create a skeleton prototype to do some of that. And so what I think we are going to do is do a skeleton prototype for doing some of that. And then we are going to leave the, the areas that were unexpected for human interaction. So this is kind of traditional way to automate something. You, what you can automate, what is repetitive and deterministic, you automate. What you can't automate, you let people do it. The same thing I think about visualization. So that's kind of a risk assessment process. Um, okay, now why do they do this, this risk assessment? Not you. In which stage of the audit are you talking about? Say that again? Which stage of the audit are you talking about? The, the evaluation? The yeah, yeah. Well, and the evaluation would be to decide whether or not they want to take on the client. No, they, they already did that. Okay. They so already did that. And uh, you are right, because the same, uh, this process here is, 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 uh, is typically for a repeat client. Uh, as I showed you in my graph that I did last time, there is a stage before that is deciding if you take okay, a client. Okay, so this is not. for a repeat client? This is for a repeat client. <laughs> because most of the engagements are repeat clients. Then they're probably looking to identify any inherent risks as part of the audit risk model. They are trying to make, make a measurement of the risk of the industry, and more than everything, the uh, PCOB have been pushing very heavily a thing that they call risk based audit. And what is a risk-based audit? It's an audit where you audit more the things that are more risky in the company, and you audit less the other ones. Uh, I, for years, have been trying to convince our sponsors to do project on payroll, on payroll audit. I thought the interesting area, a lot of innuendos, etc. I couldn't convince them because uh, the people uh, says payroll is not risky. There are so many rules, so many regulations, there are so many other inter inter external audit doesn't have a big audit risk, material risk there. Okay, we finally did a project with the AICPA as a client, not uh, as part of uh, ASEC, and the project was because AICPA is, a, is not a public company, and they were interested on having better reliability in their payroll. But I could never convince the firm to, to support it because they said we don't have risk there. Purchase to pay, order to cash, etc. are much more risky. Revenue is a big risk. Um, so they access this risk and the consequence of assessing the risk is basically I have a thousand hours of audit, I'm going to put have 200 or 
others of audit here, 100 here, 50 here. And now, I'm only going to look at this once every three years. They kind of do these type of decisions uh, based on risk. So assess assessment of risk is very important. And they typically do things like one, two, three, four, or one, two, three. Very risky, somewhat risky, not risky, etc. So this is a very coarse measure. It's a very blunt measure. Um, but the consequence of that is a resource allocation. In addition to be a resource allocation con consequence, is a, uh, is a sequencing of audit planning type of result. So what do we do first, what do we do second, and accept it. And don't think that that's immutable. What happens is you start doing the audit, and then you discover problems somewhere. So you say, oh, this area is pretty clean, this area is not clean, let's move some resources to there. Or the other thing, you go to the client and say, I budgeted a million dollars, but you have a lot of problems, it has to be 1.2 million dollars, and add hours to the audit. Okay. So that's, uh, in, in very simple formulation, uh, this thing. Now the next thing, here you say, and this is very traditional, perform preliminary analytical procedures. What is a traditional analytic procedure? You calculate ratios. Basically that's what it is. Um, but now, we are going to have many other ways to do this. And actually, I would like to have a project that is analytical procedures with ratios, but doing it differently. I call it virtual companies. You, you, you hear it in a, you hear it a little bit later. Okay. And what is what is what you're trying to do there? You're trying to a priori, when you start the audit, also evaluate risk now with quantitative methods, not a qualitative discussion. And I actually think, I think that um, these things are going to kind of blend a little bit together. Uh, the qualitative and the quantitative, uh, maybe in the two we do, we, we kind of mix them together. We don't know, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, and so you have assessing business risk, you do this numerical thing, and then you join the two of them to set materiality and assess acceptable order risk and inherent risk. Okay, inherent risk is basically a non-diversifiable risk. What does it mean? It's something that is inherent in the industry. Um, like you are in shoes business, or you are a startup. Startups are much more risky than shoe business that have been in business for 20 years making money every year. Okay? And the inherent risk is a non-diversifiable risk. Uh, however, there are other risks that you put on there, and audit risk is basically a compound of these things. And if the audit risk is very high, um, you have to do something because you already accepted the client. So probably going to increase your audit procedures, you are going to ask for more money, do something. But this whole thing is determined, determines, uh, determines certain profile risk, and then of course there are other components of this. What is this idea of internal control risk? To see how much you can rely on the internal control. To see how much you can rely on the internal control. That's right. Remember we talked about are the internal control good? You don't have to sample so much. You don't need to do more so much substantive tests. Are the internal controls bad? You have to do much more substantive risk. Are we okay with that, Christian? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so here it is. We are looking at industry and business risk. Um, we are looking at the basic inherent risk of the business, we are looking at control risk, and then we look at fraud risk as a separate thing since we have SAS 99, which basically tells you that auditors have some accountability to risk. Uh, now, 
What do you, are you going to do intuitively with that stuff? You are going to decide how much and how you audit. It's not only the resources you do, it's the processes that are going to use an audit, because you can do different things to evaluate particular accounts. And so the tool that I was talking, the VPA <laughs> tool that we are talking about, actually at this moment we're only planning to do that for the audit planning meeting on accessing business risk. We are not going to the next stage, which is choosing procedures. And of course, that will be the next tool to be developed, choosing procedures with the output of your planning, your evaluation of controls, and your fraud <coughs> risk assessment, put them all together and choose, are you going to use this, do this, this, and this in each stage of the audit. But we are not, we don't have that plan at this, this stage, okay. Um, okay, and this is, this is that kind of question that I was asking, if controls are good, and in this case is a mix of controls and risk and et cetera, you can, in the old method, reduce your samples. You can not even audit certain parts of the thing. For example, if a particular area of business is very small, it can't generate material error, so you just don't audit it. Or turn around the audits every three years or something like that. So that's, that's the kind of step that you, you take at that stage. Now, environment is changing. I already gave you this example that we're thinking about an automated risk assessment or decision support for risk assessment. Other thing that is happening here is this whole idea of samples. I think the audit of the very future is not going to have samples. Why? You heard me already say this. Because with computers you examine the entire population. Now, you might take a subset to do a special procedure and etc. but in general, you can pass many tests to your entire computer scrutiny. And that's a lot of thinking that being, needs to be done, and um, hopefully some of you are going to do dissertations on the area of effect of the area of effect of these computerized tools, full population evaluation, and etc. I don't think I had a chance last class to show you the IASB slides, did I? Did I? You guys will remember better than me, because I showed those slides recently, can't remember where I did it. No, I, I'm going to show you the, those slides. And what the slides have, have a whole set of, uh, have five situations or examples. And one example is a three-way match. The other example is an internal control automation type of thing. And then there is a clustering, there is I think, artificial intelligence thing, et cetera. These are, uh, these are the slides that we show to the IASB arguing that they need to think seriously about uh, analytic methods. And actually, the response has been good. We are again talking to the IASB in April. You know, the ISP doesn't, is every three months, they meet, and except the next one in London. I wish we did it in London, don't mind going to London. I've been to London for many years. So I used to go to London all the time while it was up at Bell Labs. They had a thing there, but no London recently. So, too bad. So the next meeting, guess where it is? Manhattan. <laughs> but anyway, it's very nice because they're interested, and I have to, you know, this presentation was made by can you remind me to send everyone the IASP slides? Uh, this presentation was with a guy called uh, Phil McCulloch, and Phil was a partner at KPMG, uh, maybe two weeks before he retired. So I am now in charge of drafting Phil back to work on the next stage, and I, I think I will be able to do it. He was very interested on this stuff. He's a very smart guy. He's, I, I have to say, I did three examples, he did two. 
and his two examples were so much better than mine, that's not even funny. Okay, but I know more technology, so, so my example would, would have nice graphs and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And they were out of dissertation, so, so it was easier to do. But it's very interesting because I think we're going to follow these things with research. We, not you, are going to follow this with research. Um, so this is kind of that question of, <coughs> oh, okay, one more thing here that I didn't talk about. There are two kinds of tests you do. One is substantive test, whereby you go and look at the invoice exists and et cetera, et cetera. That whole thing you need to rethink again, you, your generation. Why? Because no one has invoices anymore. Everything is electronic. So Andrea goes to file cabinets to look at invoices. There are no invoices there. They're all stored somewhere uh, as a PDF that you can't even process directly. But prior to creating the invoice in the PDF, there was a file that generated the PDF. And that file is probably processable. So this is a whole set of thinking, very difficult, because traditional auditors don't know the technology, and technologists don't know the traditional audit. So it's, it's a complicated thing. It will take years to change. But if the PCAOB or the IAASB get serious about this, things will change. Um, and they are getting serious about audit analytics, I hope. Now, the other thing of tests is test of controls. Remember, if the controls are good, you need to sample yes. You need to examine the population less. Now, test of controls is called compliance testing. The answer to that is ob the interpretation, obedience testing. And for example, control says um, a, a, a person cannot generate a transaction and <coughs> approve it. So that's an aut authorization issue or separation of duties issue, okay? Now, you have to go and see if that's real being obeyed. One way to test the control is pick up a large number of invoices or of purchase orders or whatever, and look who originated it and who approved it. We did a payroll, we need payables at Itaú and we found out there were maybe five, ten percent of the transactions had conflicting approvals. It wasn't fraudulent, we didn't think it was fraudulent. It was just that they had a syndicated process, many different people doing buying, and they hadn't standardized how they dealt with that. So one of the audit findings was kind of do more about separation of duties, and they did, they did. We have looked at it after that, and got better. But there is, that's a control issue. Now, so you go back to this idea of compliance. There are two things, okay? Let's say you're designing, you are manufacturing a car, and you are not Volkswagen. I'm joking. Uh, you manufacture a car, you have your engineers design the car. Then you have your manufacturer construct the car. There are two different things. One, you can examine the plan carefully and say the plan is good. But that doesn't mean the car is going to be good. Because maybe they said put aluminum alloys here and the guy put something else. Okay, you say balance its wheel, they don't balance the wheel, whatever the, whatever the situation. So there is one thing, the plan of controls, and the other thing is the obedience to the controls. So you are not allowed to approve something that you generated. That's, that's probably written there, but it's not being obeyed. So when you test controls, what you're actually doing is look at the plan of control to see if this can control purchase to pay or whatever. And then you see it says this approval rule is it being obeyed. So it's these two things. Now, if Andre already went to a file cabinet and pick up an invoice to see if the values are correct, you can do a thing called dual testing. You test controls and you test the values in the same test. Save yourself effort. Uh, 
However, the timing that is a little bit weird because you first theoretically examine internal controls, then you decide sample. But you know you're going to have to take a sample anyway, so you kill two birds with one stone. So this is the uh, uh, this is that kind of story here. Um, and then in this stage in the traditional method, you make an uh, you make uh, you say this is the number of errors I found in this in this particular sample. Is it possible that this thing is misstated? Now, uh, you guys know some statistics, etc. But just to restate, it's a population of 100. And this is kind of statistics for the masses. You pull the sample of 10. OK, so this is 10% of the population. So if you find one error here, you, your natural extrapolation is that there are 10 errors on the 100 population. OK, I know this is very simple, except that it's just for, for you to think this way. And so this stage, you extrapolate the errors that you have and come up with your estimate if this number is material. We haven't talked materiality yet, except I said we're estimating materiality early. What is materiality? It's a threshold that's determined by the auditors at the beginning of the audit for what they will accept. Yeah, actually, actually your right is a threshold, etc. But see, you're setting the materiality not at the exact beginning of the audit. Mm -hmm. You kind of is sensitive to the risk that you have. But the overall materiality, you really kind of is a duty. Uh, they have been a committee of the AI CPA, I would say, when I was doing my PhD, so it was a long time ago. And there was an impasse. The big firms wanted very objective guidance on materiality. The small firms didn't want that. So the big firms suggested 5% of net income. They suggested very complicated Ford formula, the third root of the square of fixed assets, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the end, there was no resolution, so they, they did kind of, uh, kind of very loose guidance. When everything else fails, take 5% of net income, meaning this is the profit, take 5% of that. Uh, however, if a firm is very, very profitable, or the firm has profit very small, like $10 profit for a 100 million company, 5% of that gives you a materiality threshold of $5. So that makes no sense. So people are just there by saying, well, long-term expected profit, take 5% of that called material. And the next thing is, if you have an error here of plus 10, and an error in other account of mi minus 10, do they offset or not? The next thing is, different. if you have error here, error here, error here in the balance sheet, do you add them? So these are all questions that have not been resolved by the standards. But the firms internally have standards on how to deal with that. Some of them have basically spreadsheets of materiality reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The firms have to do that because if you don't discover a material error, you could be sued. If you discover, if you, if you discover a material error, you can do things about that, like ask the client to make an adjustment. So that's uh, kind of needs to be retaught. And so one of the projects that I would like to see sometime someone do is kind of how do we calculate materiality in a modern environment, um, which is an interesting question. Uh, now, just two comments. Go ahead. Right? It should also be account specific. Depends. Certain accounts are much more important. It should have much lower thresholds than other accounts. So that's the Yehuda rule of uh, materiality allocation. You know, a lot of people have these rules, and uh, a lot of companies have their rules. Okay. Very seldom people get uh, get sued 
forbade intangible allocation. Okay, intangible is not a case. Okay? Uh, but if it's horrendous, maybe there will be a lawsuit, negligence on performing your duty. But the audit statement says, fairly stated, fairly, doesn't say exactly stated. And so fairly is the difference between, between exact and the number you have. You make the two difference. If this is the right thing, this is what was disclosed, if the difference is very big, you have a fair uh, error above the fair listing. And that difference is materiality. Now, this concept is kind of a little bit nebulous in uh, accounting, but in engineering, you know, all of us that are engineers know that measurements are relative, and if you measure very tightly, you get a better measurement than you, than you measure less tightly. And when you do a, do a plant for a building, you actually state what is the allowable error in a, a pillar of cement, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea in engineering of allowable error is pretty good. And there is no perfect measurement anyway. If you measure tighter and tighter, you get always a difference. And there is no reason to think that accounting can be exactly right. The only way accountant can be exactly right, if you lose historical costs, and what you are trying to represent is numbers that were recorded, not the real value. And you know, there is a lot of hand-wringing and worry between accountants about fair value. Um, and uh, there is a very bad joke, but I'm going to tell you the joke anyway. This guy comes down in a balloon, and he looks down, and there is a guy there working on his garden. And he said, where am I? And the guy looks up and says, oh, you are in a balloon. <laughs> okay, and then he says to himself, this guy must be an accountant, because he gives an exact answer <laughs> but it's totally irrelevant, <laughs> okay? And that's kind of historical cost. What do you care about how much you paid for a building 20 years ago? And a lot of accountants <coughs> are arguing against fair value because it's not an exact number. But historical value, meaning if historical value has two weeks old, has some relevance. Historical value and Fair value are pretty much the same. But the moment time passes, or depending on the thing, if you don't need to pass a lot of time, uh, makes a big difference. Yes. So, uh, in this case, what is exactly the definition of the material allergies? That's exactly what we are talking about. Materiality has a very soft definition. Uh, in general, it's something, an error that would make a decision maker make a different decision. So without the, the definition, how do you calculate Well, as I said, the rule of thumb is 35% of net income, but is of steady earnings uh, over time. There, there is no, no way the firms operationalize that. And the reason why, why the small firms fought it is because they didn't have the competences and et cetera that the bigger firms have. I don't know. That's my interpretation. Uh, it's also easier to defend the lawsuit. Easier to defend the lawsuit, yes. Of course, that was always a, always a concern. But, so this concept of materiality is a concept, very easy concept to understand for engineers. <laughs> Allowable relative error. Okay. Now, became more difficult now uh, to do some of these measurements because finally accountants are waking up and starting to allow fair valuation. But you know, many balance sheets still have a lot of historical cost on them. And the historical cost exercise is exactly exact answer of irrelevance. Because what the value 20 years ago doesn't help you anything. Um, that said, it's not an easy problem, it's easy to criticize. Okay, so
So here it is, you perform test control, substantive test of transaction, access likelihood of misstatements. In phase three, perform analytical procedures and test of detailed balance. And what you're trying to do here is low, medium, high or unknown risk. Perform analytical procedure, perform test for key items, perform additional details of matter. This is all kind of metal here on the sampling type of thing. And finally, you finish up. Um, you do some additional tests, I don't know what they are, for, pres for presentation and disclosures. Accumulate final evidence, evaluate the results, issue audit reports. Communicate with the audit committee and manage. So this whole thing is kind of a wrap up. You did your testing, then you make decisions of what those testing is answer you, and you kind of use those results in your next analytical step. But typically, in the traditional audit, you use only analytical procedures at the planning stage and at the extrapolation stage of your samples. Okay, and usually these are kind of package formulas that the software in the audit firm performs. And that, that's kind of the traditional method. And I've been reminding you from last time, internal control evaluation, interim work, year-end work evaluation of balances. And that, and this is the busy period. How many hours did you used to work in the period, busy periods of the year? 80 hours. Kristen, where you were an auditor too, weren't you? Yeah, KPMG. A long time ago? Yeah, I was, uh, two years I was an auditor and then more recently I was um, in the uh, accounting department in a private firm. Is anyone else here who had audit experience? Good, so two of you. Okay. <laughs> Good, keep this honest. If I say something wrong, you correct me, okay? Mm -hmm. You too. She's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to go to this, this kind of traditional way to look at auditing because we are going to talk about potential projects. And um, I wanted to have a same nomenclature. You guys want a five minutes break? <laughs> As I said, I never heard people say, no, I don't want to break. So seven minutes break, okay? 35 minutes. Um, but uh, just find the old textbook. Actually, if you look careful on the internet, there might be some public domain textbook you can use. Okay? Um, Ciao, I don't think you heard it because you're not here last time. The MIT students don't need to do the final exam. And when we review papers, they only have to read three papers, not five. Sometimes you only have three, but okay, there is a little bit of a less load. We just abuse the pieces. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, today is not a traditional class. Chow is going to um, is going to assign you to these reviews, but what I would like you to do is look at the syllabus and tell Chow tell Chow the areas you are more interested. In. And that's why I'm kind of talking about the projects right now, because if you're going to do a project on materiality, on evidence, uh, on IT audit, try to do read the articles do emphasis. You have to read all the articles, but try to emphasize the things that you want to do. Yes? Uh, are the projects individual or group projects? Uh, depending. Okay. In general, a couple of people in the project is fine. We're not talking about three or four. But the two is fine. Actually, I think it's better. Uh, however, you might want to do a project by yourself, particularly if you think it's going to be a dissertation. Potentially, do it by yourself because it's better. On the other hand, we have several dissertations here that are co-authored articles in it. So, world is changing. Okay. Now, these projects are just ideas. You can do whatever you want. But what I want you to do is today, the second week of class, by the fourth week of class, have defined what you're going to do and 
do the introduction. And in an introduction of article has to have tension. What does it mean, tension? Has, you have to explain why that problem is an interesting problem. Okay, why is important. All articles at the beginning have a motivation. And papers get rejected for lack of tension. I sent an article to Carr, and I thought the article had a great opportunity. They rejected it for lack of tension. So we published it somewhere else. But, uh, but uh, they need to have it. So what I want you to do is kind of examine the problem, think about what you're going to do. The other stages will come later. I extracted some of these ideas out of uh, old proposal I had. Some of the other ideas are out of the radar thing, and a couple of other ones are my current idea. And I don't have a slide here on the visualization project for the Volker Foundation, the Volker Alliance. And uh, if more than two MIT students want to work on that particular project, you negotiate more than one group. I don't want to with more than two people. Because I don't like groups that you do the work, you do the work, you do the work. 